Turing was um, Alan Turing, who is considered as the father of modern computing, right? So he actually did something very similar. So he had this halting problem that the, he, pro he proved that halting problem cannot be solved algorithmically. That you cannot, out of all computer programs, roughly speaking, you cannot you cannot you cannot have an algorithm of choosing out of all com possible computer programs which ones are meaningful, which ones will not, will, which ones will halt. Mm -hmm. Very depressing results all across the table. <laughs> Or, on the contrary, <laughs> life-affirming. <laughs> Depends because, on your point of view. Because everything is full of paradoxes. So that means, that, so possible. you're right, it's depressing if we are sold on a certain idea from the outset, and then suddenly this doesn't pan out. But, okay, to so which my, I retort, what if, what if he proved that actually, you know, everything can be proved? So then what? What is left to do if you're a mathematician? So that would be depressing to me. Mm -hmm. And here there is an opportunity to do something new, to, do, to discover something new, which maybe a computer will not be able to. Again, with a caveat, according to our current understanding, maybe some new technology, some new ideas will be brought into the subject. And the meaning of the word computation, like now we think of computation in a particular framework, tuning machines or church thesis and stuff like that. But what if in the future, another genius like Alan Turing will come and propose something else. The theory will evolve the way, you know, we went from Newton's gravity to Einstein's gravity. Maybe in the framework of that concept, some other things will become possible, you know? So um, it's not, to me, it's kind of like, not so much about deci deciding once and for all how it is or how it should be but kind of like accepting it as an open-ended process. I think that's much more valuable in some sense than uh, deciding things one way or another, you know? I wonder, I don't know if you think or know much about cellular automata hmm. and uh, the idea of emergence. I, I, I often return to game of life. Yeah. And just look at the thing. Amazing, right? And wonder. The kind of things they can do with such a small, um, you know, tools. That such. from simple rules, a distributed Smooth, system simple rules, yeah. can create complex behavior. And it makes you wonder that maybe the thing we'll call computation is simple at the base layer, but when you start looking at greater and greater layers of abstraction, you zoom out with blurry vision, maybe after a few drinks, you start to see some uh, something that's much, much, much more complicated and interesting mm -hmm. and beautiful than the original rules that our scientific intuition says cannot possibly produce complexity and beauty. I don't know. I don't know if anyone has a good answer, uh, a good model of why stuff emerges, right. why complexity well, emerges from a lot of simple things. Mm -hmm. It's a why question, I suppose, not a, but every why question will, will eventually have a, uh, a rigorous answer. Not necessarily. We could have an approximate answer which still eludes something. Like quantum mechanics. 99%, maybe. We will be able to describe it with 99% certainty or 99% yeah. accuracy. Yeah. And then maybe, you know, in, in 100 years or, you know, next year, somebody will come up with a different point of view, which suddenly will change our perspective. You know, to this point, I want to say also, you know, one thing that I find fascinating, speaking of paradoxes and so on, do you remember how everybody was freaking out about this blue dress and the blue, was it blue or was it black? Yeah. It was the yellow, I think yellow or and white or, bl or black and blue. Mm -hmm. It almost broke Twitter, you know, yeah. I remember that, yeah. that night. So there are many examples like that where you can perceive things differently and there is no way of saying which is correct and which is not. For instance, uh, you got this, uh, the vase, the Rubens vase, you know, where you have, from one perspective, it's a vase, from another perspective, it's, it's two faces. Then there is this dark rabbit picture where you can Google it. If, if somebody doesn't know, they can Google it and find it, it's very easy. Actually, Ludwig Wittgenstein devoted several pages, dark rabbit, in his book. And so on, there are many others. There are like squares where you can see a square, you can see the, from different perspective, this way, that way, and so on. So when we talk about neural networks, we're talking about training data and stuff. And so that you have some pictures, for example, that you feed 
to your program and you try to find the most optimal neural network which would be able to decide which one is it, is it the dog or a cat or whatever. But sometimes it doesn't have a definite answer. So what do you do then? So do, actually it's a question, I actually don't know. Has modern AI even come to appreciate this question that actually sometimes you can have a picture on which you cannot say what it is in it. From one perspective, it's a rabbit. From another perspective, it's a duck. How can, are you supposed to train if you have a neural network which is supposed to discriminate between, distinguish between ducks and rabbits? How is it going to process this? You see? Well, so the the trivial trick it does is to say there's a this x probability that it's a duck and this probability that it's a rabbit. Well, that's a good approach, but also I would say there is no like given percentages. For instance, actually, at some point I was really uh, curious about it and I, lo I looked. And for some, for, for each picture of this nature, and there are a bunch of them you can easily find online, my mind immediately interprets it in a particular way. Mm -hmm. But because I know that other people have could see it differently, I would then strain my mind and strain <laughs> my eyes and stare at it and try to see it in a different way. And sometimes I could see it right away and then I could go back and forth between the two. And sometimes it, could, it took me a while for, for some pictures. So in that sense, even if these probabilities exist, they are subjective. Some people immediately see it this way, some people immediately see it that way, and I think that nobody knows. Not psychologists, not neuroscientists, not philosophers, what to make of it. The best answer, the be of course, as a scientific mind, I I'm, even though I say, no, don't look for interpretation. Yeah. Leave some place for mysticism or mystery, right? I say that. But of course, I want a theory. I want an explanation. So the best explanation I find is from Niels Bohr's complementarity principle. So it is like particle and wave, that there are different ways to look at it. And when you look at it in a particular way, another side will be obscured. Think about it like the other side of the moon, you know? So like we are observing the moon from one side and then we don't see the other side. There is a complementary perspective where we see the other side, but not the side we normally see. Mm -hmm. But the moon is the same, it's still there. It's our limitations of being able to grasp the whole. That's complementarity. And we know that from quantum mechanics that our physical reality is like that, rather than being certain, rather than being one way or another. And we should just, as a small aside, in terms of neural networks mentioned that at the end of the day, there's humans, it's built on top of humans. Uh, or with ChatGPT that it's using reinforcement learning by human feedback. We're actually using a set of humans to teach the networks. Yes. And that's the thing that people don't often talk about because, or I, I sometimes think about that those humans all have a life story. Each human that annotated data that fed data to the network mm -hmm. or did the RLHF, yeah. uh, that, they have a life story. They grew up, they have biases. They have biases, there's some things that they like, there's some th things they don't like, which can k kind of appear under the radar screen. They may not be aware that they are exercising those biases. That's the point. What you brought up is a very important issue here. Not so much issue, but it's not a bug, it's a, it's a feature in my opinion, that Implicit in the discussion of the question is, is thinking computational and so on, is the idea that our conscious, conscious awareness covers everything mm -hmm. within our psyche. And we, we just know that that's not the case. We have, all of us have observed uh, other people who have had sort of destructive tendencies. So obviously <laughs> they did things destructive for themselves. And many of us have observed ourselves to, to doing that it, as part of human nature, right? So, and there is great research in analytic psychology and, you know, uh, in, in the past hundred years, uh, strongly suggesting, if not proving the existence of what Carl Jung called the unconscious, personal unconscious and also collective unconscious, the so, kind of a circle of ideas which are under the radar screen, which lead us to some strong emotions and, inspire us to act in certain ways, even if we cannot really understand. So if we accept that, then it, the proposition that somehow everything can still be covered by our actions, which are totally kind of neutral and totally like righteous and totally um, 
conscious that it becomes really tenuous.